This is our sixth session in a mini-series we call Remodeled. It is only at Rainmaker Ministries where we can have a six-session series and still call it a mini-series. But that's where we're at. We are in a, a, a meta-series called Revangelism. We're rethinking, we're remodeling, we will be retooling and representing the gospel as we know it so that it is effective. And we just saw a scripture last session where Paul was praying for one of the churches that he started to be effective in the sharing of their faith through the acknowledging of every good thing that is in them in Christ Jesus. And what we talked about the last time is, okay, we understand this spirit, soul, and body process. We understand that the spirit and the soul are not synonymous. They're not the same thing. The spirit is the part of us that is capable of receiving revelation from the spirit of God. It's the part of us that makes us eternal. It's the part of us that died at the fall it's the part of us that is reborn during the born-again experience when we acknowledge Jesus as our Savior. These things are, are real. Our soul, on the other hand, it is an eternal part of us, but it's not what makes us eternal. It will live on past death, but it is not what carries us forward into eternity. It is comprised of our mind, our will, and our emotions. It is the part of us that is designed to parse spiritual information that comes from God and natural information that comes from our five sense or oriented world around us and then to do something with that information primarily to make sure that we're keeping God on the throne of our lives but at the fall our soul became elevated because our spirit died it became exalted and it got out of whack and we demonstrated how instead of receiving spiritual information, dwelling on that in our mind, and making godly choices, and then having our emotions come alongside and undergird and strengthen those emotions by cultivating positive emotions and weeding out negative emotions, we function now like 95% of all humanity, where our souls receive information from the world around us. That information comes in in the form of an emotional reaction, a feeling. We react to that feeling by dwelling and thinking about how that made us feel. And from dwelling on how something made us feel, we make choices. That's the posture of the exalted soul in our lives. But this born-again experience begins to take place. We have to be transformed back into the image of Christ. In fact, last week in a couple of sessions, we determined that it was, in fact, the soulish part of Jesus that he put down in the Garden of Gethsemane, in fact, sweating blood as he asked for that cup to be passed from him, doing it God's way instead of potentially his own way, the way of his own flesh. Okay? And... That was the part of his life that he wanted to lay down so that we could receive eternal life. We looked at those scriptures that says those who seek to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will gain it. The word life in those verses is suke. It's the word for soul, that you would lose your soul. You would give up your self-life. For my sake, you will gain not suke. You will gain eternal zoe. The God kind of life. I find it necessary to just review some of these terms so we can keep it in context. And the biggest reason I find it necessary is although you should, you don't hang on my every word 24-7 throughout the week when I'm not in front of you. So we review these things. We think about these things. What we saw last time is there are tons of scriptures. We could have taken the time to go through more scriptures that says that every good thing is already on the inside of you. That Christ has ultimately completed, that we're saved by not faith in Christ, but the faith of Christ, what he did. We took a look at the right interpretation of Isaiah 55, 11, that says God's word will not return void for the purpose that it's sent. The right interpretation of that is the fact that Jesus is the word, and he would not return to the Father unless he had accomplished the purpose for which he had been sent. It's done. It's finished. 
One third of you, when you acknowledge Jesus as your Savior, becomes wall-to-wall Holy Ghost, utterly transformed. You have the same Spirit of Christ. You have the mind of Christ in that Spirit. And unlike the Old Testament prophet Isaiah, who said, who can know the mind of God, Paul says, we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. But if we have perfection on the inside of us, if the effective sharing of our faith is based on acknowledging every good thing that is inside us in Christ Jesus, how do we actualize that? How do we get it out from our spiritual part of us into the rest of who we are? And that's what we're going to look at in this session this morning. That's what we're going to take a look at. So before we jump into the soulish thing, because we know so much, so much, so much takes place in the soulish realm, we need to understand what's going on with our body. How does our body experience transformation? And even though at salvation, the spirit was transformed instantaneously, our bodies will not experience complete transformation on this side of mortality. Your basis for this and your chief commentary on this is 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It speaks of the resurrection of the dead. And in that chapter, it's made clear that one day all the dead in Christ will be resurrected and we will receive bodies like Jesus had after his resurrection. Now, what's important about that? Well, the body of Jesus Christ was capable of some things that our bodies today are not. Our new bodies are reserved to operate in a completely new reality. In the New Testament, we see Christ's resurrected body capable of many miraculous things. Jesus appeared and disappeared at will, entered closed rooms without using a door, levitated out of sight while ascending into the heavens. How were these things possible? Well, this is one of the things that becomes important because a lot of the times these portions of scriptures are relegated to fantasy. They're relegated to myth or to uh, imaginative stories for the, for the purposes of communicating a good moral. But that's really not the case. You have to realize the whole point that Paul is trying to make in 1 Corinthians 15, and we covered this in our Corinthians commentary, is if you do not believe in the literal resurrection of the dead, then everything Christ accomplished was in vain. Because his death isn't what a... There's no big surprise that the wages of sin is death. That's what we were all headed for. Sure, he took our payment and we can live. But that would just mean that we would not get punished. Wait, that sounds a lot like the salvation message. It would just mean that we would give our hearts to Jesus and at some point we would not get punished by eternal hell. We would not be... So we would just cease to exist be over. But see, there's a promise, there's a hope of eternity, there's a hope of something beyond what we experience in this temporal existence. There's more than we can experience with our five-fold senses. And what Paul is saying there is, if you don't believe in the resurrection, Christ died in vain because it's based on his resurrection that we receive ours. If he did not resurrect from the dead, then all the hope and promises that come through his resurrection, the fact that we can, in fact, have new life, is based on the fact that he got out of the tomb. And I've been there. I stuck my head inside. The good news is he's not there. He's not there. In fact, all that was there was a bunch of Ethiopian people on the same kind of trip I was singing songs that I could not understand. So, so it was there. Don't got that one figured out yet. In the 12th century, Rabbi Moses ben Nachmanides, based on an analysis of Genesis chapter 1, determined that the universe is comprised of ten dimensions, of which he said only four are knowable. Ten dimensions, four of which are knowable. Now, he didn't do this because he had particle accelerators. He didn't do this because he had any clue what the Higgs boson was. He didn't do this because he understand fission versus fusion. He did this because he studied Genesis 11. And studying the text, he, he came up with this concept 
that the universe is comprised of ten dimensions, of which four are knowable. Today, working in the field of string theory, modern physicists are describing the world as not being just about length, or height, or width, the three dimensions that we operate in, or time. That's four dimensions, by the way. But of ten dimensions, the rest of which are currently outside our ability to measure or to perceive. Secular science, an ancient rabbi studying the book of Genesis. Now, a lot of people have a hard time understanding more than three dimensions. I mean, obviously, we have, you know, the, the capacity to get two dimensions. We grew up, uh, most, most people my age, we grew up with films uh, where Disney was still cell animating almost everything. You know, we had Beauty and the Beast, and we had Aladdin, and we had The Little Mermaid. All of those films were rendered in two dimensions. But then along came a little lamp that jumps up and down on an eye and, and, a, and a character named Woody in a story called Toy Story. And animation changed forever because we have what's called 3D animation. Computers allowed us to operate in a third dimension. We could perceive it. Why? Because instead of drawing a two-dimensional image on a piece of paper that was designed in such a way through, through techniques like foreshortening and stuff like that to convey a three-dimensional image, to trick the eye into seeing more was there than was, computers were able to let you completely model a 3D character that you could rotate in a virtual 3D space. Okay? How do I know this? I know this because I own this kind of software on my computer. Okay? And you can literally, today, sculpt in what looks like digital clay. And you can make anything you can imagine. And instead of it being flat, it's literally three-dimensional. There's tools that you can grab a hold of. Architects and, and, uh, and product designers. Everybody, everything that we use is based on this. In fact, becoming much more affordable in today's world is the concept of Z printers or 3D printers. Where you can have a tool and it will spit out of plastic composite, whatever you want. 3D items that you can then piece together. It's becoming affordable that, that, that you can own it, okay? Things like coffee cups and, and stuff like that. Spit right out, on demand, okay? So what does this mean? Well, we think of length and width. That's two dimensions. Depth, okay? Uh, or length, width, and height. That's three dimensions. In computer terms, when you're drawing in a 2D program, you're dealing with the Y and the X axis. In 3D terms, when you step into to, um, coordinate or um, picking up a coordinate in a 3D space, you're dealing with the X, Y, and Z axis. Okay, that's giving you 3D space. So where does time come in? Well, time is the fourth dimension because time is a 3D point in that 3D space at a specific moment in time. So you can start at frame one of an animation and then add in 10 frames later, and you can get to this place where you, it is moved. It is in a different space in time at that point. Time is just a dimension. Time can be altered. Scientists have now proven that time is affected by mass, space, and gravity. In a realm where there is no mass, space, and gravity, three dimensions, there is no fourth dimension. There is no time. That's a revelation of 20th century science. How is, that, how is that even possible? We have now, we always thought that time was constant. Okay? And time was equivalent to approximately, you know, to you get to the speed of light. Okay? Well, not only are we learning that time's not constant, that time can accelerate or that time can slow down based on mass, space, and gravity. We're also learning that the speed of light has been changing. This one's fun. Because you get all these evolutionists that say, okay, well, if the universe isn't billions and billions of years, how do you account for distant starlight? How do you, how do you, how do you account for that? Scientists are now determining, secular scientists, by the way, not, not just the Christian guys, 
okay, are determining that the speed of light has been slowing down and that it could be as much as 40 times faster during the days of Adam than it is now. So if light was that much faster back then, it wouldn't have taken light billions of years to reach us from where those stars are at. Does that make sense? All of these things that we assume to be constant, they're changing. They're changing. And there are dimensions that are beyond the four dimensions that we think about. Dr. Emmett Brown in Back to the Future, he always told Marty, he says, you're not thinking fourth dimensionally. You're not thinking with time. Time changes things. These are those dimensions. Jesus' body was capable of existing outside of the constraint of time. Our resurrected bodies will be capable of existing outside the constraint of time. People say, well, well, what about these, what about these people who die? Where do they go? Well, we're still living, and we're waiting to get to the, to the throne of Christ. And, and if, if the dead in Christ rise first, and then we go up to meet him, and where, where are they sitting? Marty, you're not thinking fourth dimensionally. It's only on this side of this mortal coil that we're bound to this constraint we call time. We think of time as a dot with a, with a line and then an arrow. It starts with the past, you have the present, you have the future. No. Time is just a measurement. And if you're outside of time, it's all conceivable that when we get to heaven, we could be arriving at the exact same moment as somebody that died 200 years ago. We are not constrained by time. God is not constrained by time. See, what that also allows you to do, and I'm just taking the time to, to hit on a few of these things this morning, is people say, well, well, how does God predestine something and man still have free will? How does God say that such and such is going to occur? Two-thirds of the Bible are prophecy. How is it possible that God can predict the future? How can he be the author and the finisher of our faith and still have a choice? One of the ways, one of the ways they look at this is, is it was predicted that Judas would betray Christ, right? Well, did Judas have free will or was he predestined to wind up in hell because he betrayed Christ and then hung himself. See, we have a tendency to apply to God our constraint of looking at him as existing within time. If you're standing outside of time, you can look at the moment of Judas' birth. You can look at every choice in his life leading up to his betrayal of Christ. His betrayal of Christ the remorse in his heart, all within the same moment. And you can predict what happens because you can see it all at once as if it's happening in the same instant. And yet Judas is still capable of making every choice along the way completely independent and on his own. See, we misascribe things to the nature and character of God. What a cruel God to condemn somebody to a faith. What a stupid understanding of physics to think that God is limited by the same four dimensions that we are. I don't have to chalk it up to God moving in mysterious ways unless you want to call existing outside of time mysterious from the standpoint that we cannot yet do it. Okay? Those are just some of those things that, that matter about that. On top of this, physicist Frank J. Tipler, in his book, The Physics of Christianity, mathematically explains what quantum mechanics and global relativity are revealing about the science of our faith. He says in his book, contrary to what many physicists have claimed in the popular press, we have had a theory of everything for about 30 years. Now, theory of everything, the, the universal theory, the, the theory of everything, how everything works. He says, most physicists dislike this, theory of everything because it requires the universe to begin in a singularity. In other words, it all had to have a starting point. That is, they dislike it because the theory is consistent only if God exists and most scientists are contemporary atheists. They don't like to admit that it all had to come from somewhere. He goes on, from the perspective of the latest physical theories, Christianity is not mere religion but an experimentally 
testable science. Reality as we know it will one day change. It will again conform to reality as it existed in the original normal state of all things, what we call aletheia truth. It will, it, we will see reality as it has always existed to God. Okay? So we receive our bodies as part of the final stages of cr the creation's redemption. We only get these new bodies in one of two ways. We either die and are resurrected at Jesus' return, or we are transformed when Christ returns to gather his bride. Either way, our bodies aren't destined to transform for a while. But that does not mean our spirits cannot have an effect on our bodies today. Robert Jastrow, founder and former director of NASA's Goddard Institute of Space Studies, provides a suitable conclusion to these kind of thoughts in his book, God and the Astronomers. He wrote, the scientist who has lived by his faith in the power of reason has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He is about to conquer the highest peak. As he pulls himself over the final rock, he is greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there for centuries. Our bodies can be transformed. We can actuate supernatural power to see supernatural healing take place in our lives. The reason that we have struggle with that is in order from supernatural power to come from our spirits and get into our bodies to, to, to inhabit and affect our physical forms, it has to go through this troublesome thing we call the soul. It has to go through your mind, your will, and your emotions. And that's why so few people see this actuated inside of their lives. The soul is the part we participate in the transformation of now. Our spirits were transformed in the past when we accepted Christ. Our bodies will be completely and utterly transformed at our future resurrection. But our soul is the point of transformation we have to deal with in the present. Transformation begins with the renewing of our minds. So how do we affect this transformation process day to day? Romans 10, 17 says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Who's the word? Can't hear you. Who's the one it's the faith of that has completed us? Jesus. Right? By hearing the word. By putting it inside of us. What did John 8, 31 say? And Jesus said to those who believed, they already believed, big deal, even the demons believe and tremble. He said to them, you are my disciples if you abide in my word. The mandate of discipleship is living, dwelling, being in his word constantly. Because faith of God the promise that he accomplished what he said he set out to accomplish comes to you through his word. Why? Because this entire world, this entire planet, everything around you tells you it's not done. It tells you you're a sinner. It tells you you're imperfect. It tells you you screwed up again. It tells you you hurt. It tells you there's pain. It tells you you're not healed. It tells you you're not a success. It tells you your marriage is falling apart. It tells you your job sucks. It tells That's everything... And how many of the scriptures that we've looked at in the last sessions on this portion of Remodeled could you summon to you if you needed them at a moment's notice? How many of them could you call forth out of the depths of your recollection and have them to realize that all things, every good work is completed in you in Jesus Christ? That your faith is made, the sharing of your faith is made effective by the amount you are acknowledging who Jesus Christ is, what he's accomplished, the fact that Ezekiel 36, 26 says that he took out from you a heart of stone, put in you a heart of flesh. He put in you a new spirit, and it is the promise of that new spirit that will cause you to walk in his commandments. It has nothing to do with you. You're in that spirit, you're in that word, and you will walk in his truth. 
No, we go back to the world's religion. We go back to I have to do it, and I have to prove myself good enough. I've got to get myself cleaned up before I can come back to God. I have to somehow do something before He can use me. Newsflash, if that's how you want to operate, you need to remember you're a dirt ball. You started out a dirt ball, you're going to wind up a dirt ball, and the only reason you've ever been any use to God is because He decided to shape you into His image and breathe His breath into you. Dirt does not clean dirt. You ever tried it? It's very frustrating. Make sense? But see, when the Word comes in, the biblically ordained process of transformation that we've been talking about is wholly different than what most religion spends time talking about. And you have to renew your mind. You have, to, you have to think about this stuff because your faith of what Jesus did comes from understanding his word and being able to put yourself in the place of these scriptures again and again and again and again. Elsewhere in Romans, this time Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Not possible. You know, I, I'm going to rant for a second. When people pray, well, God, if it's your will, I start to get antsy. I would not be any fun at a gathering of most Christians coming together to pray for 24 hours over pancakes and syrup. It just, just wouldn't, it wouldn't. Make me happy. And the reason? God, if it's your will, if you'll do this, if you'll just step in, if this is what you want, what did that verse just say? That you may prove what is the good and perfect will of God. A lot of people, they, they also take this verse, and they really like to just slot if, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect. And they'll try to build this whole... Di- well, you know what? There's this, there's, this, uh, there's this perfect will of God and, and there's this permissive... There's these things that God will just allow to happen. There's what God really wants to happen. And then there's the things that because He's sovereign and in control of everything, they're the things He really doesn't want to happen, but He'll let happen. That defies logos to me. That defies logic to me. He's God. Think of this verse differently. What is good? God is good. Right? Everything he created, when he created everything, he said, it's good. It's good. It's good. It's very good. Acceptable. Three qualifying factors. I almost look at that as it's good to the Father. It's acceptable because of what Jesus accomplished. And it's perfect because of the Spirit on the inside of you. All three got their seal on the will of God. There's only one will. He's not schizophrenic. He's not having an argument with himself. Let's back up. Let's look at the verse one more time because I think this is important. He says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. If you're being transformed to a revelation, spiritual understanding, that Jesus has already accomplished all there is to accomplish, 
And that when you choose to allow him in because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word and your soulish mind is dwelling on the things that have been written by the spirit according to the mind of Christ in his word. That mind of Christ that is in your living spirit grabs a hold of that and it creates a a cataclysmic event inside of you. It launches something wherein the thoughts of God are released inside your spirit. They come inside your soul, and suddenly you're just dwelling on his reality instead of your reality. Your mind is receiving divine, I am complete. That's completely contrary to every religion on this planet, including the religion known as Christianity. I am complete. I am changed. I am transformed. It's by his spirit. He's making me walk in his statutes. He's doing these things. Lord, all these parts of me that don't look like that, I give you permission. Just take over. You've got control. I'm letting you do. Suddenly it went from your mind to a place of choice. It went from your mind to a place of Of God, you've got control. You've already done it. I thank you that it's done. I thank you that I don't have to do it. And you start making decisions, and it begins to affect your world. The way you see the world changes. You begin to be able to discern between soul and spirit, like Hebrews 4.12 says, and you can see what's going to affect you negatively because it's soulish, it's suki cost, it's soul-led. Or things that are going to affect you spiritually because it's pneumatikos, it's spirit-led. And you walk that truth and you navigate your world with a revelation of what Jesus has already accomplished. It comes from the Word and it affects your world. It comes out of the Spirit. It exists in your mind. And you just keep renewing that process over and over and over again. On a daily basis. And this is how your mind begins to transform. This is how you begin to operate differently. See, renewing our minds affects the choices we make daily. It comes from the spirit into our minds. And now we start to make different choices because the word inside of us is discerning between the spirit of God and the soul of man. James 1, 23 through 24 says, For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. You have to put the word into action. You have to use the word. You have to use the logos, the logic behind the message that Christ represented, how he lived, what he did, who he was, and what he accomplished through your choices. Because if not, you're doing it the soulish way. Does it feel good? Does it feel bad? Does it make me happy? Does it make me sad? The promise is when we do it the world's way, or when we do it the word's way, All of those wrong choices get eliminated and the word of God shoots through and just picks the right choice. You want to know the will of God for your life? Meditate on his word. You want to know the will of God for your life? Get in that place where you're operating from a spiritual, supernatural understanding of who he is. And suddenly you just look at the choice and it's like, well, that's obvious. Kind of moron can't see that. People are always waiting for God to part the heavens. For God to show up and say, Son, don't do that. That's the wrong choice. The difference is, that is already done. That's done in your spirit. If you're not accessing spiritually the place where that has happened, God is not going to come over your soul or come over your body and say, don't do that. He did that in the Spirit because the Spirit is where change comes from. Nothing that was made around you was made without spiritual impetus, without spiritual force. The Bible says the things which are seen were made of things which are not seen. Now, 
from a physics standpoint that obviously can communicate molecules and atoms and all of that kind of stuff that comprise all of the stuff we look at. Sure. But from the supernatural standpoint, what he's saying is if it didn't come from the Spirit, if it wasn't spoken by the Spirit of God, if it didn't come out of Jesus, without Him, nothing was made that was made. And yet we walk around trying to get Him to give us input from any other source except the spiritual source that He ordained, which is His Word that is living and powerful and sharper than any sword and divides between the joints of bone and marrow and soul and spirit. If we begin at the right place, our soul transforms automatically, you see? And if our soul is transformed, our body transforms. Our world transforms. The way we interact, our relationships transform. Our marriage is transformed. Why don't we have to have a retreat every year in this church to take couples away and teach them how to have a better marriage like so many churches do? Because I know if I teach you spirit, soul, and body, it'll fix itself. If I teach you spirit, soul, and body, you'll get the wisdom of how to handle your finances. If I teach you these things, you will change in the wisdom of God that opens the eyes of your understanding will come to you. If you're in a church that's not doing this, why get out of bed on Sunday morning? So we saw and this is the tricky part. We saw how when the Spirit's in the right place, our thoughts begin to change because the mind of Christ begins to have influence over our natural mind, our soulish mind. And when that happens, trust me, you just get so fired up, you just start, your choices just be, God, I want to choose, I want to, that's so cool, I want to choose you. Your way is easier, your way is better, I get it, I want to choose you. So you've got the mind and the emotions of your soul taken care of. We, we get that, right? But then comes the trickiest part of the soul of all. The emotions. You see, harnessing our emotion undergirds the righteous choices we've made by the word. Proverbs 23, 7 says, For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. And remember, heart... We demonstrated that can mean soul, that can mean spirit, but in reality it's showing you just like your heart has two sides, a left ventricle, a right ventricle. There, there's, there's two components. You can be thinking from the mind of Christ and be that way, from your spirit. Or you can be thinking from the mind of a soulish man and be that way, from your soul. It will drive your reality. Romans 8, 6 says, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Let's, let's forget the life and death thing for just a second. How many of you would just like to walk through your daily life with peace? Not feel like it's always cr crisis mode? Not feel like you're, you're the next episode of 24, the next episode, you know, so the world's going to end in the next five minutes if you don't cut the right wire at the right time. The world is cataclysmically going to explode. People are going to die, and it's all on you. The Spirit says that's not the case. In fact, the Spirit makes an even better promise. The Spirit says the peace of God which surpasses understanding will guard your heart and mind. Heart focusing on mind will guard your thoughts, will take over the soulish component of who you are. So yeah, but I'm just under attack from the enemy. Uh, Satan is just coming after me and I've just been under... The God of peace will soon crush Satan underneath our feet. Do you think he's going to crush him while you are not operating in spiritual peace? 
That's funny because the Bible says where there is envy and strife and confusion, there is every evil thing. What do you want? Strife, confusion, envy, every evil thing? Or peace that surpasses your understanding? Life and death. Deuteronomy. Chapter 30, verse 19. God speaks and he says, I call heaven and earth to, rec to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. See, unfortunately, in Deuteronomy, he was setting it before them according to the law. A law which in their souls they were never going to be able to live up to because it needed to be fulfilled by spiritual supernatural means. Remember when we did our Leviticus study, I told you that Leviticus, that came, that, that, that's an English name for the book, that it came from uh, because the Levites, the priests, came from Levi. Not all Levites were priests, but all priests were Levites, okay? And so the, the, because it had so much to do with the Levitical rules, it got its name Leviticus, okay? To the Jews, the book is the first phrase of the first verse of the first chapter, which says, and he called. It's the book of the called. It's the book of the called out ones. Deuteronomy, what does that word even mean? In Hebrew, the book is just known as words. Deuteronomy is the last five sermons of Moses before he died, reminding Israel of the covenant that they have with God, speaking to the generation after the one that died out in the wilderness. Why? Because they needed to be reminded that their fathers failed to live up to the destiny that God had for them. And it was now their time to step up and walk into the promised land and crush the giants, to dispossess those that were living in a land that God called his property. So we have this misnomer too, thanks to the old Negro spirituals and stuff like that, that, that the promised land is the sweet by and by, that it's someday, that it's heaven. That's what it's an allegory for. But let's look at that for just a second. There were giants in the promised land. There were pagan cultures in the promised land. There was hard times and battles that needed to be. Does that sound like heaven to you? See, the promised land is an allegory for you walking out the calling and the destiny that God has for your life. For you to stop wandering around in the wilderness, farting around with the basic elementary principles of your faith, and decide it's time to cross over the Jordan. FYI, that generation, they grew up. The men in that generation, they grew up uncircumcised. They had not yet signed on to the covenant that they were going to walk in with God. And so before Joshua could cross over with them, there's an account in the early chapters of Joshua where all those men had to get circumcised. I find it humorous because it details that they would spent the next three days lying around the banks of the Jordan. Go figure. But what it speaks of is before you walk into the promise of God, have you cut covenant? I'm going to walk this out your way, God. I've made the commitment. We're going to do this by spiritual means. We're not going to do this. We're not going to do this by any means other than what your spirit says. Not by might, not by power, but by your spirit, says the Lord. And so it's in that context that Moses is, is sharing this in Deuteronomy 30, 19. He says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. That both thee and thy seed may prosper. Are you sowing seed of the Word of God? 
Do you want it to prosper? Because remember what we said at the beginning, Isaiah 55, 10, and 11, the Word of God, the Word of God is seed. The New Testament tells us that. The Word of God is also the rain. But if you're not choosing the life of the Spirit, the rain of God, you can't water that seed that you think you're sowing. You can't do it. You can't do it. So let's talk for just a second about our emotions. How we think will determine who we are and who we become. Our life and peace are determined by our thoughts. God's thoughts are our worldly thoughts. Either way, the choice is up to us, but our exalted souls are out of whack. We think that our emotions just come and we can't control what we feel, but thanks to Christ's mind operating in our reborn spirits, we can choose to operate in a revelation of who God says we are instead of how we perceive ourselves in this reality. We're taught in this culture that your emotions just come and you feel what you feel. You need people to validate your feelings. You're not responsible for what you feel. But the reality is you can cultivate positive emotions and you can remove negative emotions. You can do that by holding yourself accountable to live your life by the word. Because what that book says is your reality. And anything that does not line up, comport, agree with, that reality is a lie. Even if it's really a strong emotional tug on your heart. Let's finish with this thought. Make this the scripture that you meditate on throughout the week. Ephesians 4 20 verses 24. It says, But have you not so learned Christ? If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. You've got to let me pause there. The truth is in Jesus. Anything that is not the truth of Jesus is a lie. Your reality has to be determined on who he declares you are. On what he declares he accomplished. That you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. In the what? That's confusing. I thought my mind was a part of my soul. Yes, but spiritual things fuel your thoughts. If you choose not to operate in the word, soulish things will fuel your thoughts. Natural things from this world will fuel your thoughts. What this is saying is the only way you can operate in the fullness of the promise, the only way your faith can be made effective by acknowledging all the good things that Jesus has done on the inside of you is to continually fuel your mind with the Spirit of God. Because our soul and our body have not been completely redeemed and as something that is not completely redeemed, it is subject to the second law of thermodynamics. It's known as the law of entropy. The fact that things go from order to chaos. That story I told you, that girl walking through the woods, you find a house. Would you think that that house was just there, that it just happened? No, it happened by design. The only way you can choose to walk in the spirit is by design. You push yourself into the word. 
You don't have to seek to live a perfect life. You don't have to eliminate all the sins that seem to so easily beset you. You don't have to, you don't have to make yourself holy in the sight of God. All he's saying is you put yourself in my word. My reality, what I accomplished, the truth that Jesus did it all. And you embed yourself on that and you dwell on that and you think on those scriptures. You make that the overarching focus of who you are and your soul will change. Your desires will change. Your emotions will change. Your choices will change. Your bodies will change. You will experience supernatural transformation in a naturally corrupt world. I'm only asking you to be spirit-led by design. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you may put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Remember what we said? If God qualifies something as one thing, it necessitates that anything is not that thing as the other. Evil is not the opposite of good, it is the absence of good. If there is a fervent and effective prayer, there is a prayer that is neither fervent or effective. If there is a true worshiper, then there is a false worshiper. I've got news for you, friends. If there is a true righteousness and holiness... There is a false righteousness and holiness. Doing it yourself or doing it the way these verses said we do it.